the last two hours. <laughs> Right. Yeah. <laughs> there you are. And we only saw each other recently, didn't we? About and you you actually asked me, oh, who's coming up on This Is Your Life? That's right. And I, I can't believe it. <laughs> <laughs> did Pip know about it? She certainly did. Oh, she's yeah. naughty. <laughs> but she's been a major instigator. She said it. there was never going to be any secrets between me and Pip. <laughs> well, after 28 years, maybe a little secret. That's right. <laughs> oh, fantastic. Do we go on with the meeting? The two-way mirror that we used this afternoon... Yeah, that wasn't fair. It, it, it wasn't very fair. Because I hate meetings. Do you? Yes, it, and for me, to, I have a ten-minute attention span. I'd rather be rock climbing. So I don't know what you got of me at that meeting. Well, let's just have a look at some footage. It's rather embarrassing. I, I, I know you're a good sport. You won't mind. There it is. <laughs> Dozing off. Across the board, enthusiasm for this message. The message is everything, and you have to realise... But, uh, so no one can say that uh, that we tell people about this because no. Uh, there's no way you would have been dozing up. No, no way. Don't show anyone that, please. <laughs> the, the Prime Minister will be horrified. <laughs> <laughs> Dick, please take a Thank seat. Thank you. <laughs> Richard Harold Smith, you were born on the 18th of March, 1944, the younger of two children to Herb and Joan. You grow up in Roseville, Sydney, right next to a national park. And the bush is an imaginary world where you stage some of your earliest adventures with snakes and lizards. We were just like Enid Blyton's famous five. It's the girl who lived <laughs> over the back fence 40 years ago. Bronwyn. Bronwyn Bitcher. <laughs> What a surprise. surprise. <laughs> so did you have a secret club going or something, did you? Oh, certainly. We yeah. had a, a clubhouse down in the bush that was a sort of old pigeon loft. And uh, we had secret codes and magical adventures. Were you the accountant or was I the, the treasurer? I was the treasurer. Right. <laughs> no, no travel rules? <laughs> no travel rules. No, no. Okay. They were wonderful days in the bush and you could... In those days, kids, of course, could just disappear into the bush, couldn't we? And Absolutely. no problems. Absolutely. And we had our own private waterfall, too, a bit further down. Yeah. But well, I was the treasurer. I think that made me the boss, didn't it? That's right. And, <laughs> and then, of course, when Bronwyn became famous, I said, I know her. <laughs> <laughs> Bronwyn, thanks very much for joining us. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bronwyn, to see you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Dick, you start school at five, attending Roseville Primary School. Now, you're an average student and extremely shy. And this makes it difficult to fit in with other children and causes your parents to often wonder... Whatever will become of Dick? It's your mum, Joan, and sister, Barbara. <laughs> <laughs> and Joan, was Dick really that introverted? Well, he was very shy. He was different to the uh, other children that were around us. But I think he marched to the tune of a different drum. And um, his father and I respected this, taught him good rules, and tried to let him um, express himself in his own way. Be himself. Yes, be himself. Yes. Yeah. I had wonderful parents. Indeed. A wonderful family life. It was just wonderful in those days. Good brother, Barbara? Yes. <laughs> Dick, like our wonderful mum, has this creative spirit that never wavers. And they're all always interested in everything. And Dick, I'm most proud of for being an example of what one person can do to inspire a lot of Australians and perhaps the world. Yeah, thank great, Dick. Thank you. Great. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Barbara. Thanks, Barbara. Thanks, Barbara. Thanks, Barbara. 
Thank you. Dick, your uncle Harold is a keen radio enthusiast, but is sadly killed in World War II. Your grandparents are so devastated by his death, they lock his room, leaving it just as it is for years. Then in 1952, when you're eight, your grandfather gives you the key to that room. You open the door and are confronted by an Aladdin's cave of radio technology inside. What was your reaction? Oh, I just thought this is the most wonderful sort of dream of just it was the days of crystal sets and things like that and I suppose it started my my life my career it's also now you meet a friend who shares the same passion as you for the bush he encourages you to join the scouting movement and is also the person you still credit as one of your greatest influences David McPhee is recovering from surgery but he sends you this message oh, wonderful. G'day Dick so I can't be there tonight but I'm with you in spirit do you remember that time you came out of my place and you had a glass jar absolutely chock-a-block with live funnel web spiders? <laughs> that was 40 years ago, and I bet your mother's never heard that story till now. Congratulations, Dick, on being a great achiever and a great Australian. <laughs> then in your early 20s, you received one of Scouting's highest honours, the Baden-Powell Award. And it's now you meet a girl guide with whom you decide to set up camp with for yep. life. But I thought he was interested in someone else. It's your wife, Pip, of 28 years, and your daughters, Jenny and Hayley. Aren't they beautiful? They are, they are. <laughs> The women in your life. Yes. Now, Pip, why did you think he was interested in someone else? How could he be? Well, I was a very shy 17-year-old schoolgirl, and my twin sister Susie had told me she thought that Dick had another girlfriend, but I found out later that wasn't true. And then I discovered that he was interested in me when we went out in a boat together, and you held my hand. <laughs> and we're still holding hands. That's great. And Jenny, how would you describe him as a dad? Oh, he's the best dad in the world. Oh, yeah. he's the most curious <laughs> man. He really is the busiest man, but any time Hay and I wanted his time or attention, he always gave it to us. And Dad, we love you very much, and we're very proud of you. Oh, thank you. Aren't you kind? Mm -hmm. And Hayley, you girls have always been particularly close to your father, haven't you? Oh, uh, absolutely. <laughs> I don't know if you've been to an Australian Geographic shop lately, but you imagine. <laughs> Every time you go shopping, he's always looking at us just to make sure I'm not getting up to too much trouble. So, um, Dad, even when we were young kids, you taught us how to roller skate, you taught us how to ride a surfboard, even though you couldn't do either of them. <laughs> we think you just the best and thanks for everything. Oh, aren't you wonderful? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Dick, in August 1968, when you're 24, you start your own business. You open Dick Smith Car Radios. Then after five years of hard work and determination, you open the chain of Dick Smith Electronics stores. And there with you, right from the beginning, is your old friend Ike Bain, who's in the audience with us Hi, tonight. Ike. Your stores sell everything from batteries to electric toilet seat warmers. That's right. <laughs> Dick, is it different sitting on this toilet to any other toilet, do you think? Well, it's exactly the same, except it's just a little bit warmer, which makes it a lot nicer, of course. And how does that feel to you, then? Well, unfortunately, I've got my pants on and so forth at the moment, but I've had one of these toilet seats for about three years, and they're really fantastic. <laughs> That's embarrassing. But after the break, Dick literally takes off. But first, some messages. Dick, congratulations. It's a tribute which is thoroughly deserved for you've been an inspiration to countless thousands of Australians as we've all watched you test the limits of uh, courage and endurance on your various adventures and challenges around the world. You've been a great ambassador for Australia, and I know this from having been in countries after you visited there. But most important to me, uh, you're not just a self-made man who's made a few million, quite a few million, Dick, but uh, <laughs> you've recognised that uh, while you've been fortunate, there are others in the community significantly less fortunate. You have been a genuine philanthropist and have sought to share 
your wealth uh, with others uh, in need. And I congratulate you for that. I wish you well in all your future endeavours, whatever they may be. Well, good day, Dick. And uh, I'm really sorry I'm not with you there tonight, but uh, I'm with you there in spirit. And I'm quite sure that you're really into everything and got everybody excited because you're such an energetic person. I'm very proud to have known you. You're one of my greatest inspirations. Have a good time and listen to this. Many happy campfires till we meet again. <laughs> Welcome back to This Is Your Life and the Adventures of Dick Smith. By the time you're 36, Dick Smith Electronics is a multi-million dollar empire. It seems you're capable of just about anything you put your mind to. But one thing he couldn't do was find water under the ground. It's the man who helped you set up the Skeptic Society, Barry Williams. Yes! <laughs> <laughs> now, now, tell us about finding water, was it? Ah, uh, Dick and a number of other people, uh, including the prominent American skeptic James Randi, uh, set up a water dividing test and uh, they buried some pipes in the ground and covered them over and, and put water in one of the pipes and invited people to test them out with their various gadgets. To prove they couldn't? Well, we wanted to see if they could, uh, <laughs> and they tried and they failed. And we've done it again since, actually, and uh, Dick turned up with that one with his helicopter with his check fluttering out the window, and nobody won that one either. Because there was, there was quite some money at stake too, wasn't there? Oh, the first one, I think, $100,000. Uh, the latter one, I think, was $30,000. We'd... It's now uh, got down to $10,000. Someone may win it. <laughs> <laughs> so, Dick, what actually is it that attracts you to people like Barry and, and the American James Randi? Well, I, I've, I've always been, had a very inquiring mind, and I remember I was watching on the Don Lane show Uri Geller, and he was bending spoons, and I believed it totally. And I thought, gee, this is incredible. I better find out how it happens. And I found out very quickly that it was really a con. It wasn't true. And so that sort of made me a bit more sceptical and then I got with a few guys and we formed the Australian Skeptics which is really just to have a healthy scepticism about things and I've always been like that. <laughs> Barry, thank you very much for joining thank us. Thank you. <laughs> you. Dick, by now you own over 50 stores throughout Australia and New Zealand but you crave new challenges, something different. Why? Ah, oh, I've always had the spirit of adventure from the days when I was a young boy in Roseville. I used to disappear into the bush and I just wanted a challenge to test myself. So you decide to sell the business. And this now gives you the freedom to do what you long to do most, to take off on a great adventure. And after two years of planning, you embark on your incredible round the world solo flight in a helicopter. This epic journey tests every mental and physical fibre in your body. But they aren't the only odds you're up against. When you land at Balmoral Castle to meet Prince Charles, you discover bullet holes in the chopper's fuselage. And one of those bullets comes very close to hitting you. Do you know what happened? No, we, we could never work out. I flew down the coast of Greenland and maybe some Eskimos had got their sealing rifles out and shot at the helicopter. I don't know what happened. And how close did that one bullet come? Oh, just right in front, about nine, nine inches from me. Very lucky. After 50 long weeks, you complete the world record flight, which still stands today. Two people who also take part in your adventures and stunts are Nancy Bird Walton and Hans Tholstrup, who join oh, us now. Yeah. Now, Nancy, you've even flown with Charles Kingsford Smith, haven't you? Yes. And how does Dick compare as oh, a pilot? Oh, he's excellent. He does his homework well, he's, and you never have a minute's worry flying with him. He invited me to fly in the Perth to Sydney Air Race with him. That was terrific. I nagged him a bit, said, keep it on the step. I remember that. But he said, you know, you mothered us. I said, he said, you were like a mother. I said, no, you mean a mother-in-law. <laughs> She's absolutely wonderful. <laughs> and, and, and you've been involved uh, in some of Dick's craziest stunts, haven't you? I think the most dangerous thing Dick ever did was when we jumped the double-decker bus over the, me, please. over the motorcycles. <clears throat> a double-decker bus? A double-decker bus over the motorcycles. Evil Knievel was jumping over, uh, remember he was jumping a motorbike over double-decker buses. Well, I couldn't 
ride a motorbike. And so I thought I'd do the opposite. And so I managed to talk hands into driving the bus. It only cost $1,200 for the bus. And uh, we got immense publicity all around the world. I don't imagine. <laughs> Nancy Hans, thank you very much thank for you. joining us. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and after the break, Dick once again flies into the history books, but first, some messages from some mates. Congratulations, Dick. I'm sorry I can't be with you tonight. Do you remember eight years ago when I was preparing for my flight around the world, you came into the hangar where my aircraft was. It was in a hundred bits. I was hoping you would give me your support. You didn't think I was disorganised and you did support me, morally and financially. And I really did appreciate that. It just was so important to me at the time. Dick, I think you're an incredible inspiration to Australians. Congratulations on tonight and have a wonderful time. Hi Dick, congratulations, well done. And uh, as you can see, we're still being pirates every now and again. <laughs> Three and a half years later, and very much thanks to you for that, because I'm sure that if you didn't become our guardian angel by putting money into the Sydney season, we may not be here today. So all the best to you and to Pip. And Pip's got to now twist your arm as we all go off to Broadway with pirates and hope you come along. See ya. <laughs> Back to this is your life and the record-breaking Dick Smith. In 1986, you launched the Australian Geographic magazine, and this makes you the country's most successful single title publisher. Then you're almost 50 in 1993 when you focus on becoming the first person to cross Australia non-stop in a hot air balloon. We did it! We did it! We can't believe it! We've done it! How hard was it? Bloody hard! <laughs> <laughs> now, that must have been a walk in the park compared to soloing the chopper around the world, huh? Well, it was, it was, it was difficult. The soloing the chopper around the world was the hardest thing I've ever done because I was very inexperienced, I was by myself, I was frightened most of the way and I only, uh, it was really only the support of Pip ringing when I'd ring her every night that would keep me going. But the balloon flight, that was hard because you're totally out of control. I admire these balloonists. While most people know you for your adventurous spirit and world records, others know you for your incredible generosity. And one of those people is the Reverend Ted Knox, who approaches you to help set up Life Education Australia, the biggest community-run drug education program for primary and now secondary school students in the country. You develop a close bond with Ted, who loses his battle after suffering a stroke. Well, tonight, Ted is represented by his son, Wesley, who joins us now. Wonderful. Wesley. Great to see you, mate. Good to see you. Oh. Good to see you. Good to see you. Wesley. Ted. Wesley, life education was very important to your dad. Oh, it was, it was just so important. He lived and breathed life education, and, uh, and I think that... Uh, Without Dick, though, it wouldn't have been anything because uh, Ted had a vision, but Dick really was the builder. And he, he didn't just throw money at it, he actually got involved, he was concerned about every brick, uh, every nut and every bolt. Was and fantastic. how did your dad feel about Dick? Oh, uh, well, obviously, Dad loved you very much, Dick. And, uh, it was mutual. Yeah. I mean, he was the most wonderful person. Yeah. And Dad used to look so much forward to the uh, times when he'd come up to the bush and uh, explore right. the bush with a couple of middle-aged kids. Uh, yeah. And uh, anyway, on behalf of uh, Ted and, and the family, thank you very much. Oh, for thank you, Will. Aren't you kind? Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, oh, oh. Now, Dick, there's one great friend who wouldn't miss being here tonight for anything, even if that meant us flying him all the way from Florida to be here. It's the well-known international sceptic, James Randi. Oh. James! Oh, so good to see you. Yes, that's a I'll do that one. <laughs> now, James... This man's helped you out a bit, hasn't he? Yes, I came a long way just to tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, he did. As a matter of fact, uh, Dick sort of rescued me at one point. I was being sued by Mr. Uri Geller. You may remember him, the spoon bender. What a profession. 
And um, Mr. Geller was suing me, in fact, in different parts of the world. And I almost had to give up the defense. And uh, then one day something happened. But first, I'd like to show you the silly trick upon which this is all based. They gave me some spoons the here. Spoons. Oh, they've got them all sealed up, hermetically sealed. <laughs> An official envelope. And uh, he just loves this trick. But you're just going to use magic, aren't you? Yeah, well, I'll just use uh, <laughs> a little skullduggery here, perhaps. Uh, these are stainless steel spoons, you can tell from the sound of them. And um, I'm just going to hold the spoon like this and uh, give it a gentle stroke. Now, the illusion is very strong, ladies and gentlemen. Some people in the audience even seem to think that the spoon is actually getting rubbery and bending. That's all an illusion, strictly in your mind, of course. Some people even tell me that it bends to the point where it gets wobbly and turns into rubber, sort of. What a profession. Oh, look at that. <laughs> Hold out your hands, would you, Dick? A miracle. I don't know how it's done, and I don't care. <laughs> well, this is what started me into skepticism, because it was saying Yuri Geller do it, and I thought it was... You know, it's scientific, but it appears it's just magic. What I did here was the trick. When Mr. Geller does it, he says it's a divine power. I did it without divine power. Can you imagine that? And I must say that uh, when I was very short of money there, I didn't ask for it. Dick didn't announce it. But suddenly, at my home in the United States, an envelope arrived. I opened it. No comment inside. Just a check for a rather substantial amount of money. Now, you may think you're a very fortunate man. We're the fortunate ones, Dick, because you believe not only in people, but you believe in your country, and you believe, more importantly, in yourself. That's Mr. Smith. Aren't you kind? Well, thank you. Thank you, Alan. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gary. <laughs> I'll put it down here. <laughs> well, Dick, you've certainly flourished from that desperately shy schoolboy to a leading businessman to Australian of the Year. And you'll always go down as one of our greatest adventurers but the bottom line is, you care. Dick Smith, this is your life. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Our guests choose to stay at the ANA Hotel Sydney.